the second time I met O.J. Simpson. <laughs> it was right after the trial of the century. There I was, now a young man of probably 23. O.J. Simpson was the most famous or infamous face on planet Earth. I was in a restaurant in Beverly Hills with my agents. I wasn't alone in the restaurant, but I was alone. I was the only black person in the restaurant. <laughs> and in the 90s, that felt very uncomfortable. Now I tend to enjoy it at this age. <laughs> I was having dinner with my agents, celebrating a deal that they told me was lucrative, but I later learned fucking sucked. <laughs> and suddenly, a group of women walked by. Every race was in that group. Black, white, Asian, Latina, white, white, and white again. They were all gorgeous. I watched them walk by. Then I saw a familiar face, Al Collins. Couldn't believe what I saw. And then close behind him was O.J. Simpson, newly released from jail. The restaurant fell still. I was shocked. I didn't mean to say it out loud, but it just came out. <gasps> O.J. He stopped, turned around to see who said it, saw my black face and correctly assumed it was me. <laughs> I was sitting in the corner of the booth. He leaned over all the white people I was having dinner with and shook my hand. How are you, young man? He looked in my eyes and I could see in his eyes that he didn't remember meeting me the first time. <laughs> and then he walked away. And I looked back at my agents, and all of them had nothing short of disgust on their faces. And the only one with the courage to voice their disgust was a woman named Sharon, who used to represent me. How could you, she said. How could you shake hands with that murderer? I said, Sharon, with all due respect, that murderer ran for over 11,000 yards. <laughs> Now, I could be bitter and blame all the police, but now I'll tell you who I blame. It's those fucking sketch artists. <laughs> they keep drawing the same brother over and over again. Who is this generic man we all look like? I want to know what they say when it's us. You know what I mean? Like, be in that room like, did you get a look? Do you see the guy that tried to rob you? Yes. Yes, I did. He was about six feet tall, I'd say. Six feet tall? Yes. He had his hat on backwards, too. Good. That's good stuff. Hat was on backwards. Yes. He was black? Okay. Big lips, big nose, dick hanging out. Say no more, sir. I'll draw him from memory. <laughs> you know, let me get my stencil. I think we can trace this guy and save some time. <laughs> the only thing in our society that bothers me the most is the way that men and women don't get along no more. That's really what's bugging me about it. Men and women just don't get along. Like, I hear women say this all the time. I know a lot of your sisters be like, chivalry is dead, don't you? Don't y'all feel that way? Like, men aren't gentlemen anymore? That's right. Chivalry is dead, and women killed it. There's a fundamental difference in the way we're gonna see things. We're not gonna see eye to eye on this issue. We're just not. Our test in life are different. A woman's test in life is material. A man's test in life is a woman. Now, by test, I mean that those are the things that we desire. Men have nice cars. Not because they like nice cars, because they know women like nice cars. That's how it goes. Because men are hunters, and the car is the bait. And the woman comes and says, ooh, nice Porsche. 
Gotcha, bitch. <laughs> That's how it is. That's true. Come on, man. You go to a woman's house, her house be comfortable as shit. Women love comfortable surroundings, so men get comfortable surroundings. But let me tell you something. If a man could fuck a woman in a cardboard box, he wouldn't buy a house. <laughs> But that's still not where chivalry got killed. Chivalry got killed by the feminist movement on the magazines that got women going crazy because women got too much advice about men from other women. And they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. And it's true. I see this shit in the, ma in the magazines. I don't read them, but I'll be seeing the cover. I look at, I be in the grocery store, fellas, you look at one of the magazines, like, what is this? And they say on the cover, a hundred ways to please your man by some lady. <laughs> Get out of here, man, come on. There ain't no hundred ways, that list is four things long. Just suck his dick, play with his balls, and then fix him a sandwich and don't talk so much, and that's gonna happen. And then, the magazines trick the women. The magazines start picking at your self-esteem. Every page you turn, you start feeling fatter and uglier, and you feel like your clothes aren't good enough. And the magazines have you forgetting how fucking beautiful you are. And that's what happens. Now look what happens. And then you forget how beautiful you are, and we all suffer. If pussy was a stock, it would be plummeting right now because you flooded the market with it. You're giving it away too easy. This is, I'm just being truthful. I'm just talking. It would plummet. We'd be watching the news today, pussy plummeted again on the NASDAQ. Gold is up 10 points. <laughs> you can see it. You ever, you ever have this happen? This is how confusing it is. This, this is the practical application of what I'm talking about. Like a guy be out, this happened to a lot of guys. You be out at club, bar, right? You just kicking with your boys, and, and a girl walks by, and, and man, she looks good. She looks good. Not good in that classical way. I mean, you know, I'm talking good. Like, she got half her ass hanging out her skirt. Mm. <laughs> Her titties are all mashed together, <laughs> popping out the top of her turtleneck and shit. <laughs> and you with your buddies, right? You with your buddies, you got a couple drinks in you, and you see, girl, you might try to talk to her, this might not come out right. I don't know what you say, but <laughs> damn, look at them titties! <laughs> <laughs> The girl gets mad and she oh, uh-uh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Just because I'm dressed this way does not make me a whore. Which is true. Gentlemen, that is true. Just because they dress a certain way doesn't mean they are a certain way. Don't ever forget it. But ladies, you must understand that that is fucking confusing. <laughs> Just is. Now that would be like me, Dave Chappelle the comedian, walking around the streets in a cop uniform. Somebody might run up on me. Oh, thank God. Officer, help us. Come on, they're over here. Help us. I'm like, oh, just because I'm dressed this way does not make me a police officer. You understand what I'm saying? It's like, all right, lady, fine, fine. You are not a whore. But you are wearing a whore's uniform, I'll tell you that shit right now. <laughs> Little misunderstandings can happen. And then men, we misunderstand women a lot. You know, we, we always undermine their feelings. You can't do that to them. You can't, because, see, feelings are, you see how they're clapping? Feelings are very important to women. They are all important to women. I'm just learning this shit. Everything's based on how they feel. You can hear when they tell stories. 
You ever tell, hear a man tell a story, it'd be just facts. Who, what, when, where, why? It was me and Bob, we was at Safeway. Then that nigga Bob said this, then I punched that nigga, and then I broke out. That's the story. That's the story. Women tell stories and all these feelings. And, well, first of all, you have to understand, I was on my period and I just talked to my mother. So I was feeling like, ah, like, oh, damn, there's too many feelings. What the fuck happened? Get to it, get to it. But I gotta talk about them. You gotta talk about them. That's how they always get me. I've been sitting there watching TV, chilling and shit. My old lady come up to me, David, we need to talk. <laughs> Fuck! <laughs> I don't say that out loud. That's how I feel inside. <laughs> because I know every time we need to talk, we need to talk about some shit that I gotta do. <laughs> we don't ever have to talk about anything she needs to do. She leaves me defenseless. I have to do what I have to do. David, we need to talk. Nah. <laughs> Don't do that to me, David. This is serious. Stop talking in that voice. No, see. <laughs> I gotta do this, see. Nah, see. Goddamn sick of it. This is the worst time ever to be a celebrity. You're gonna be finished. Everyone's doomed. Michael Jackson has been dead for 10 years, and this nigga has two new cases. <laughs> and if you haven't watched that documentary, uh, then I'm begging you, don't watch it. <laughs> it's fucking gross. I felt like HBO was sticking baby dicks in my ears for four hours straight. <laughs> really nasty shit. I want to know all these things. <laughs> Turns out, uh, Michael Jackson allegedly likes a long gander at the anus. <laughs> As they said, he stares at people's buttholes. That's what they said. That's how gross the documentary was. I'm gonna say something that I'm not allowed to say. <laughs> but I gotta be real. Uh, I don't believe these motherfuckers. <laughs> I do not believe it. But let me qualify the statement. I, I am what's known on the streets as a victim blamer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Somebody come up to me like, Dave, Dave, Chris Brown just beat up Rihanna. I'll be like, well, what did she do? <laughs> Dave, Michael Jackson was molesting children. Well, what were those kids wearing at the time? <laughs> I don't think he did it. But you know what? Even if he did do it, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, it's Michael Jackson. <laughs> I know more than half the people in this room have been molested in their lives. But it wasn't no goddamn Michael Jackson, was it? <laughs> this kid got his dick sucked by the king of pop. All we get is awkward thanksgivings for the rest of our lives. You know how good it must have felt to go to school the next day after that shit? Hey, Billy, how was the weekend? How was my weekend? <laughs> Michael Jackson sucks my dick. <laughs> and that was my first sexual experience. If I'm starting here, then well, sky's the limit. I know it seems harsh, but man, somebody's got to teach these kids. There's no such thing as a free trip to Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, he's gonna wanna look at your butthole or something. <laughs> yeah. 
You know why I don't believe it? You know why I don't believe it? Because if Michael Jackson's out here doing all this molesting, then, then why not Macaulay Culkin, hmm? <laughs> Macaulay Culkin said in an interview that Michael Jackson never did anything inappropriate with him or even around him. Think about that shit. You know, I'm not a pedophile. <laughs> but if I was, <laughs> Macaulay Culkin's the first kid I'm fucking, I'll tell you that right now. I'd be a goddamn hero. Hey, that guy over there fucks a kid from home alone. And you know how hard he is to catch. All our stars, man. Our Kelly pissed on his victim. I know, it was rough. But I mean, again, I can't even judge our Kelly. First of all, we don't know if these allegations are true or not, and even if they are true, if you want to know how I feel about it honestly, if a man cannot pee on his fans, I don't want to be in show business anymore because, well, that's why I got in the game, baby. I got dreams too. You guys are confusing the issue. Why you guys are busy worrying about if R. Kelly even peed on this girl or not, you're not asking yourself the real question that America needs to decide once and for all. And that question is, how old is 15 really? No, oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. I'm not saying that a person is as smart as they're gonna be at 15. That's not what I'm saying, man. But I am saying 15 to me is old enough to decide whether or not you want to be pissed on. I mean, that's me. If you can't make a decision like that by the time you're 15, then just give up, motherfucker, because life is way harder than that. I make tougher decisions all the time. If you don't want to get pissed on, just get the fuck out of the way. It's not even a decision. If I start peeing on the front row, they're not gonna have to calculate and think, oh, how do I feel about this? Am I okay with it? They just move. <laughs> you can do that at 15. I, I could have. I've been 15. When I was 15, I was doing stand up in nightclubs. I smoked reefer from time to time. Friends were selling crack. I was trying to finger fuck people. I knew what was happening around me <laughs> to some degree. Getting pissed on was the least of my worries at 15. Trust me. But it keeps coming up. There's a lot of confusion around that age. Anytime 15 comes up, people freak out. Like when that girl, Elizabeth Smart, got kidnapped. Right? Remember in Utah last year, 15-year-old girl, Elizabeth Smart, was kidnapped. And then they finally found her, and the whole country was relieved. And I was the only one saying, damn, she wasn't that smart after all. <laughs> not because she got kidnapped. That could happen to anybody. I'm not knocking her for that. I'm just saying, if you kidnapped me when I was 15, you gotta take me further than eight miles away from my house, man. God damn. You can't hold me prisoner around shit I recognize. I'll break away. I'll, I'll break away. Fuck off me, nigga. That's my bus stop. I know where I'm at. I'm going home. She was missing for six months, eight miles away from my house. That's two exits, man. That's nothing. And while she was missing, during this half a year that this girl is missing, there's a seven-year-old black girl gets kidnapped in Philadelphia. Nobody knows her name. They might have talked about it two or three times on the news, but she should have been the top story. Because she chewed through the ropes and had both of these motherfuckers in jail in 45 minutes flat. Seven years old. I'm not making this up. These two crackheads kidnapped her and took her back to the crack house and tied her up. And then they left her. He said, crackheads, they gotta make moves. Crack, smoke, chocolate to eat. These motherfuckers made moves, it was out. But as soon as they left, this little girl got the nibbling. She was kidnapped at four o'clock and at home watching herself on the news at 5.30. That shit is crazy. That's a, that's a news story. That is a news story. Now, meanwhile, in Utah, 15-year-old Elizabeth Smart's captors left her alone, too. And they didn't even tie her up because they're hillbillies. They just bounced. Don't try to escape, bitch, or we'll kill you. Be right back. They leave. And she's 15, sitting in the house by herself. How am I going to get out of this? Come on, Elizabeth, think. Think, Elizabeth, how am I going to get out of here? 
Why don't you just open the fucking door and go outside? Have you thought about that? Do you have a quarter? Do you know your phone number? You're 15, bitch, run! Stop thinking and stop making moves! I know I sound mean, and I know what the people are thinking when I'm saying this. Dave, she is only 15. All right, but that's the discrepancy, because when you talk about a little girl like Elizabeth Smart, then the country feels like 15 is so young and so innocent. On the flip side, here comes 15 again. Now we're talking about a 15-year-old black kid in Florida. This black kid accidentally killed his neighbor when he's practicing wrestling moves that he saw on TV. Now, was he a kid? No. They gave him life. They always try our 15-year-olds as adults. The snigger knew what he was doing. It's a goddamn pile driver. If this kid gets on the ropes, there's no stopping him. You'd have to send the rock to arrest him. And they gave a 15-year-old boy life in jail. If you think that it's okay to give him life in jail, then it should be legal to pee on him. That's all I'm saying. You gotta make up your mind across the board how old 15 actually is. That's all I'm saying. So I'm gonna tell you right now, if somebody comes in here and puts a gun to my head and says, Chappelle, you got a choice to make. You're either going to jail for a month or we'll let you go, but you gotta let R. Kelly pee on you. <laughs> I'm not hesitating. Bring in R. Kelly and tell him to stay away from my ass. I'd rather get pissed on on the outside than fucking the butt on the inside, so. I can't go to jail with some smooth Botox balls and think everything's gonna be all right. It's not that kind of place. Take my chance with that piss. Piss will wash off with a 10-minute shower, I'm certain of it. This piss coming right out. What can I do? They're gonna put me in jail. Too much pressure. That's my problem. I can't, I can't handle pressure. Sometimes pressure makes me talk different. I'm serious. You ever have like that social pressure? You ever talk to somebody who's fake and they make you fake? Like, they come to you like, hey, how you doing? And you're like, fine, how are you? And you're like, I don't even talk like that. I get sick of that shit. I do, it just makes me sick. Sometimes I'll talk crazy just to make myself feel better. Yo, do that, just, just start talking like crazy. Have you ever heard this voice? Man. Nah. That's, that's how bad guys used to talk in the 40s. In the old days. See, I, used, I talk like that. Not all the time, but if somebody put the pressure on me, fuck it, I gotta, I gotta cut loose. <laughs> if the police pull me over, I, I'll talk crazy. Son, son. Do you know why we pulled you over? Nah, because I'm black, see? That's right. Nah. I do it. It's not illegal to talk like that. How do they know I don't talk like that every day? Stop talking like that. Stop talking like white copper. Nah. That's how I talk, see? You got to make life interesting like that because the shit is flimsy. Life is flimsy. You, you think you're going to live forever, but you're not going to live forever. It's dangerous out here. We know what's going on. I travel now, you know. I used to think D.C. had the roughest ghettos in the country. Nah, nigga. Uh-uh. <laughs> I have seen some shit now. <laughs> oh, there's some rough, rough areas outside of D.C. Yeah, everybody should go to the ghetto. I was taken to the ghetto one time. That's the worst. When you get taken and you're not expecting to go. You know, usually you want to know when you're going to the ghetto, like, I'm going to see some wild shit. I got to prepare myself. I'm going to see something crazy. When you're taken, it's different. I had a limousine driver. It was after a show. It was late at night. It was like 3 in the morning. I had a limousine driver. He was a nice guy talking to me and shit. Oh, hey, where you from, dog? D.C.? Word? That's a rough city, man. And his cell phone started ringing. Hold on one second. Hello? Oh, what's up, nigga? What? What the fuck? Slow down. What? What the fuck? No! 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 Fuck that, nigga. Fuck it. I'm on my way. Hey. I gotta make a stop real quick at three o'clock in the morning. I didn't know he was taking me to the ghetto at first. 
I started looking out the window. I was like, what the fuck? Is gun store, gun store, liquor store, gun store. Where the fuck are you taking me? <laughs> this don't look good. He didn't say shit. He just pulled up in front of an old rickety building that looked like a project. Now, I'd never been there before. I'm not sure if it was a project, but it certainly had all the familiar symptoms of a project. <laughs> a, a, a fucking crackhead ran this way. <laughs> And then, and then another one jumped out of a tree and shit. <laughs> and I said, I'll be right back. <laughs> and left me. Took the keys with him and just left me. <laughs> At three o'clock in the morning, in front of a project, in a fucking limousine. <laughs> this was not good. I was like, man, I gotta look around and see if I can see some landmarks and figure out where I'm at. Might have to escape on foot. Now, this is when I knew I was in a bad neighborhood. You only see this in the worst neighborhoods. Remember, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. I look out the window. It was a fucking baby standing on a corner. <laughs> <Look at this. laughs> and the baby, the baby didn't even look scared. He was just standing there. I mean, it made me sad, it made me sad, really. You know what I mean? Because I wanted to help the baby. <laughs> I was like, mm, I don't trust you either, I'm sorry. Click! <laughs> Click! The old baby on the corner trick, eh? I'm not gonna fall for that shit. Where's this limousine driver? You know, I stopped feeling bad. As time goes by, I start feeling worse. Like, man, what is wrong with me? What the hell is wrong? I'm scared of a baby. I mean, this baby could be in trouble. He might need my help. I got to do something. But I wasn't going to get out the car. <laughs> I'm serious, man. I just cracked the window a little bit. There's an old limousine. I can roll it down. <laughs> hey, baby. Baby, go home, man. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. What the fuck are you doing up? <laughs> the baby said, I'm selling weed, nigga. I said, oh, shit. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to buy two bags from the call miner. Let me get two, let me get two from him. Got back in the car and rolled me a joint, man. So, that shit was scary, man. Every once in a while, like a crackhead would come up to the car and look in the window. It was like Jurassic Park and shit. He'd be looking on the car. <laughs> hey, get out of here, cracky. <laughs> that baby was still standing there, man. Then I started feeling bad again. Yeah, weed make you feel guilty sometimes. You know. Man, what is wrong with me, man? I have just bought weed from, a, from an infant. I can't condone this kind of behavior. What am I thinking? I can't let the fear ruin my morals. <laughs> Gotta do something. <laughs> hey, baby. <laughs> Stop selling weed, all right? You got your whole life ahead of you. He said, fuck you, nigga. I got kids to feed. I said, God, <laughs> damn. Can't do everything. Maybe weed. If you're gonna do something, do a little weed. Smoke some, weed. Weed's not as bad as everything else. So weed is a background substance. You know I mean, you can smoke some herb and still function. And you ain't crisp, but you'll function. Nothing higher than weed, though. I made that mistake one time. I, I was at a party, some guy gave me some shit. He's like, here, man, take this. It's fucking mushrooms. I took it, I forgot all about it, you know. Then a couple days later, I found that shit in my pocket. I'm thinking, why not? Because I'm thinking it's like weed, some background shit. I planned my whole day out like it was weed. <laughs> I'll chew this shit up 
Then I go to the barber shop, get my hair cut, and then I'll see a movie. <laughs> I chewed it up. So far, so good. <laughs> then I was in a barber shop like an hour later. And it's funny because I was just thinking to myself, I was like, ooh, this stuff sucks. <laughs> Tastes like an athlete's foot. I feel sick, but I'm not really high. Then I looked in the mirror. <laughs> I saw the barber's reflection, man. It looked like, it looked like a big penis was cutting my hair. I freaked out. I started talking to myself, Dave, calm down. You're on drugs. This is what drugs do. Okay, you know that there is no way that a penis can cut hair. <laughs> but I started freaking out, man. I just couldn't take it anymore. I jumped out the chair, half my hair was cut. I didn't care. I, I didn't, I just gave a bob a handful of money. It was weird, the balls opened up. Anyway, I, <laughs> I ran home, man. I ran home as fast as I could. It's tripping, it's tripping. I looked at the clock, it was 2.42. I was like, damn, 2.42. I gotta sober up. I had never been this high this early. I took a shower. I was still high. I said, maybe music will do the trick. I listened to every CD I had. I was still high. Exercise, that's what I'll do. I ran around the block four times. Still high. Took a nap, woke up, fucked up. <laughs> I looked at the clock, it was 2.43. I said, God, <laughs> damn. But there's a more important reason that I would stop doing comedy right now. And this reason is the real reason that's been percolating, and, and it really is the crowd, not you. I'm talking about the crowd on the big stage. It's too hard to entertain a country whose ears are so brittle. Motherfuckers are so sensitive, the whole country has turned into bitch-ass niggas. <laughs> Everything you say upsets somebody. <laughs> but motherfuckers are just taking it too far. I don't know why or how everybody got this goddamn sensitive. You know who hates me the most? The transgender community. Yo, yeah, these motherfuckers, I mean, I didn't realize how bad it was. These motherfuckers, I was really mad about that last Netflix special. <laughs> it's tough, man. I don't know what to do about it, because cause I like them. I always have. Never had a problem with them. You know, just fucking around. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I think I make fun of everybody, and... I mean, as a group of people, they have to admit, it's kind of fucking hilarious, man. I'm sorry, bro. It's like, I've never seen somebody in such a hilarious predicament not have a sense of humor about it. They're born feeling like there's something other than they're born as, and that's, that's kind of funny, you know? I, I mean, it's funny if it's not happening to you. I believe transgenders. I don't understand them either, but I know they mean what they say. <laughs> them niggas cut their dicks off. That's all the proof I need. I've never seen somebody just throw their dick away. Don't need it. <laughs> I don't understand, but I believe you and I support your decision, motherfucker. There's a problem in that feminist movement, isn't there? From its inception in America, there's always been a racial component. When Susan B. Anthony was having that meeting and Sojourner Truth's black ass showed up. <laughs> Read your history books. All the white women asked Sojourner Truth not to speak. They didn't want to conflate the issues of women's rights and slavery. But you know how black bitches are. Sojourner Truth went up there anyway. <laughs> She 
She did a famous speech. She said, ain't I a woman? Ain't I a woman? That's right. And, and listen, listen, listen. I, I supported the Me Too movement, but, but the whole time, the whole time I thought that the way they handled that was stupid. <laughs> it was, it was white. It was like, <laughs> they were doing shit like going to the Golden Globes and, and all of them would be like, let's all go to the Golden Globes and wear black dresses to give these men a piece of our minds. Bitch, that is not gonna work. You think Martin Luther King's gonna be like, I want everybody to keep riding the bus, but wear matching outfits. <laughs> you gotta get off the bus and walk. It's real talk, a real talk that was a silly movement. I want everybody to wear a crocheted pussy hat so they know we're serious. <laughs> what the fuck was y'all doing? And then I said something about it in one of my specials and all these women actresses came after me. I said, man, fuck y'all too, you canceled. I ain't jerking off to none of your pictures again. <laughs> they were like, who is he to tell us anything? I'll tell you exactly who I am. I'm the one that got off the bus and left $50 million on the bus and walked. <laughs> I agreed with these women. I just didn't agree with what they were doing about. Right, right. No, it was annoying as fuck. <laughs> because if these women were serious, you know what they would have done? They all would have fired their agents. And they would have went to the mailroom of one of these big agencies and found a woman that was busting her hump in there and said, if you want to talk to us, then you have to talk to her. And if they did that, and she would be big, and they would be big, and nobody would get fed to Harvey Weinstein. But did they do that? No. Was that their idea? No. Surprisingly, it was mine. And what I think the feminist movement needs to be very successful is a male leader. I'll do it. I will. I will lead you women to the promised land. I will make sure you get equal pay, equal work. I will make sure that nobody harasses you or fucks with you on the job. I will protect all of your interests and all that I ask for in return is that you suck my dick. <laughs> and now we're right back to square one, aren't we? Is it sad in stone? Just know I never wanted you to there's no place like home If you wanna try to let me know oh. Cause I've been facing the memories we created Timmy was one of my first white friends like in my life, man He was a good dude too He moved to Silver Spring from Utah of all places I guess his family was affiliated with that Mormon church they got down there and Me and him used to hang out and one day I was at his house, we were just hanging out, and, and Timmy says, Dave, why don't you stay for dinner tonight? I said, oh man, I'd love to, but I can't. If I'm not home before dark, my mother will kill me. That was a lie. <laughs> my mother had several jobs. I hadn't seen her in like three or four days. <laughs> and the only reason I lied to Timmy was because at that point in my life, it was my experience that white dinner wasn't delicious. <laughs> I'd rather go home and fry some bologna or some shit like that. <laughs> but then old Timmy threw me a curveball I wasn't expecting. He said, oh, it's too bad you can't stay, Dave, because um, mom uh, made stovetop stuffing. I said, what the fuck, stovetop? <laughs> well, hold on, nigga, let me make some phone calls real quick. I had seen that commercial so many times, I had dreamt of getting my hands on some of that stovetop stuffing. And finally, I met a motherfucker that actually had a box of stovetop in the house. 
I couldn't miss this opportunity, so I pretended to call my mother. And then I came back and I said, Timmy, Timmy, you're not gonna believe this great news. Mom said I can stay. And he said, fantastic. He said, why don't you come with me and we'll help set the table and then we can say the blessing. I had no interest in setting this motherfucker's table or saying these crazy ass Mormon prayers. I just wanted that goddamn stuffing. So I told Timmy, I said, you know what? I'd love to help, but let me go wash my hands first. My plan was simple. Wash my hands slowly, and by the time I'm done, the table will be set, the blessing will be said, and all that there will be left to do is eat. <laughs> Went to the bathroom. I washed my hands very slowly. I must have been in there for about 10 minutes. <laughs> and suddenly, one of his mothers came to the door. She was like, hi, David, right? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, Timmy tells me that you're planning on staying for dinner. I said, I hope that's not a problem, ma'am. She says, no, it's no problem. In fact, we'd love to have you. It's just that we weren't expecting company. And I'm afraid there's not enough stovetop stuffing <laughs> for everybody. So I kicked her in the pussy. Bam! Ladies and gentlemen, I told you I'm dope, nigga. I told you what I was gonna say and you still didn't see it coming. And that's why I make the big bucks. You know who I feel real bad for is, is Indians. Everybody feels bad for Indians. They get dogged, they get dogged openly because everybody thinks they're dead. These motherfuckers are not all dead, all right? I've seen, with my own eyes, I've seen a gathering of 1,500 Native Americans. They were all gathered in one place. The place is called um, Walmart in New Mexico. <laughs> There's Indians there. I've never seen Indians before. I wasn't even sure if they were Indians. I was fucked up, but I, I asked one of them. That's not nice, but I seen them in the sports section looking at bows and arrows. I had to say something, oh, excuse me. I, I don't mean to be rude. Um, are you an Indian? And he was cool. Yes. Yes, I am Indian. Still didn't believe him. I had to test him to be sure. This is fucked up. But I had a gum wrapper in my pocket, so I balled that shit up and I threw it on the floor. And a single tear came out of his eye. I said, oh shit. I had so many questions. So what tribe are you from? I am a Navajo. I said, word. <laughs> I studied you in social studies. <laughs> You're a hunter-gatherer, correct? <laughs> he said, I guess so. <laughs> That's what you wish to call it. I said, why, what do you call it? He said, I am an alcoholic. <laughs> I said, well, what's your name, dog? He said, please, dog is my cousin. That was a good guess. <laughs> my name is Running Coyote. What is your name, friend? And that shit caught me off guard. I mean, I didn't want to say my name was Dave to a motherfucker named Renan Coyote. This don't feel good enough. He's putting me on the spot. I said, huh? My name, what? Oh, my name's uh, Blackfeet. <laughs> then I changed the subject. Forget about me, what's going on with you? I wanna meet your chief. Why don't me, you, and your chief, and your friends get together tonight? We could have a real live peace pipe smoking ritual. We need to celebrate, nigga. I thought you were dead. And he set it up, it was beautiful. It was just like I dreamed. We was all sitting around, them Indians was beating the drum. <laughs> Some other Indians came out the back with a long blanket that was folded in half and put in, in front of us. Open that shit up, and on the blanket was a long wooden pipe with feathers. And bags of weed were all over the blanket. <laughs> 
chief walked over. The big ones are 50. The little ones are 25. And these are 10. Man, those Indians got high as shit. I was baked. I told the chief, he was talking, I cut him off. Time out, chief. Sorry to interrupt. I'm fucking smashed, man. The weed's too strong. I'm itching. Is this PCP? The, the spirits have got me. Chief, the spirits have got me. And the chief threw some water in my face. Calm down, blackface. Splash. I said, hey, it's black feet, motherfucker. Take it easy. Black feet. You are welcome to stay amongst me and my tribe for the night until the spirits leave you. And they gave me my own teepee to sleep in, which sounds nice. I personally felt like it was a little fucked up, you know, because they all had houses, man. It's like, why can't I sleep with y'all in the house and watch TV? Like, I can't be on this grass all night. Now, I was hanging out with a friend of mine. He's a white guy, you know, we were just hanging out. Yeah. And we were lost in the city, you know, we were smoking a joint. Now, I don't know if it's a coincidence that we were lost and high and shit, but... <laughs> My white buddy, he was smoking a joint. <sighs> Dave, Dave! It's the goddamn cops. I'm gonna ask him for directions. I said, Chip, no! Chip, don't do it! It was too late. He was walking over there, this man was high as shit. Excuse me. Excuse me, sir. Touching him and shit. Excuse me. I need some information. Uh, start confessing things he shouldn't confess. I'm a little high. All I want to know, which way is 3rd Street? The cop was like, hey, take it easy. You're on 3rd Street. <laughs> you better be careful. Go ahead, move it. Move it. And that's all that happened. That's the end of the story. <laughs> now, I know that's not amazing to some of you, but you ask one of these black fellows, that shit is fucking incredible, isn't it? I'm saying a black man would never dream of talking to the police high. That's a waste of weed. <laughs> Serious. I mean, I'd be scared to talk to the police when I'm sleepy. They fuck around and get the wrong idea. <gasps> oh. oh my God. That nigga was on PCP, Johnson. I had to use necessary force. You saw him. No, no, no paperwork. Just, just sprinkle some crack on him. Let's get out of here. That's how it is. But at the time, I didn't think there was anything racial about it. I was just like, man, Chip, you got fucking lucky. You better be careful. But then another time, me and Chip are driving. Now, I'm not driving. Chip is driving, and he's driving a little crazy. He's been drinking. I don't like to let my friends drive drunk, but, you know, I was smoking a joint. I couldn't really say shit to the guy. <laughs> and we get at a red light. We stop at a red light, and a car pulls up next to us, and I'll never forget it. Chippy looks at me, he's all drunk, and she's like, Dave, I'm going to race him. <laughs> I knew it was a bad idea. But I was high. I tried to explain to him it was a bad idea, but all that came out was, well, nigga, sometimes you got race. I don't know. <laughs> Man, that light turned green and Chip took off. Zigzagging and shit, so no one could pass him. I didn't even know he was racing. <laughs> then the police seen us and pulled us over. Now you understand, I'm scared as shit. I mean, come on, the car smells like weed. 
I've been speeding. This man is fucking drunk. I was scared. Chip was not scared at all. It was weird. He didn't even turn his radio down. Isn't that weird a little bit? I mean, if you get pulled over, wouldn't you turn your radio down? Nobody want to get their ass beat to a soundtrack and shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Chip had the music blasting. We're not gonna take it. Look at the music, Dave. Just relax. <gasps> Close your butt cheeks. Just relax. <laughs> Let me do the talking. You want to know what he said? This is almost exactly what he said. I, I couldn't believe it. He says, oh, oh. Sorry, officer. I, I didn't know I couldn't do that. <laughs> I was fucking shocked. The cop said, well, now you know. Just get out of here. Just get the fuck out of here. She said, okay, I'll... I will, sir. Thank you. What? What's wrong with you, Dave? I didn't know I couldn't do that. He said, that was good, wasn't it? Because I did know I couldn't do that. <laughs> I'll be real with you, and I know nobody gives a fuck what I think anyway. Uh, I'm not for abortion. Oh, shut up, nigga. <laughs> I'm not for it, but I'm not against it either. It all depends on who I get pregnant. I don't care, I'll tell you right now, I don't care what your religious beliefs are or anything. If you have a dick, you need to shut the fuck up on this one. Seriously. This is theirs. The right to choose is their unequivocal right. Not only do I believe they have the right to choose, I believe that they shouldn't have to consult anybody except for a physician about how they exercise that right. Gentlemen, that is fair. And ladies, to be fair to us, I also believe if you decide to have the baby, a man should not have to pay. That's fair. If you can kill this motherfucker, I can at least abandon him. It's my money, my choice. And if I'm wrong, then perhaps we're wrong. Just figure that shit out for yourselves. <laughs> I mean, really, y'all, what the fuck are we doing? I can't live in this new world you're proposing. And meanwhile, while we're worrying about all this other shit, look at what's happening. They just killed another 12 people in a mass shooting in Virginia Beach. This shit's happening every week. It happens so much, I'm almost, I don't care anymore. I came home early from the road. I had a $12,000 suit on, because life's been going good. <laughs> and I got home early and dinner was cooking. You ever come home when dinner's cooking? Doesn't that smell good? And my son saw me and he was like, Dad's home. And he got up from the table and ran over to give me a hug, but he had chicken grease all over his face. So I stiffed on him like, yo, 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 my man, my man. <laughs> Watch these threads, son, this is an expensive suit. I don't want you to get the chicken grease all over me. And he was like, what the f chicken grease? Dad, this is duck. <laughs> a tear came out of my eyes. I never dreamt I'd do so well in life that I'd raise a nigga with duck grease all over his face. It's one time racism saved my life, man. I was, I was on a plane. I, I, was coming, I was coming from overseas, and uh, I don't know how this guy got a machine gun on the plane, but he stood up, man, he said, Everybody, get on the fucking ground! Nobody look at my face! I started freaking out. 
because he was Chinese. I was like, why is he talking like that? <laughs> he was screaming and crying. I was the only brother on the plane. Well, I, I thought I was the only brother. I looked over, there was one other black dude. He was from Nigeria. I, I looked over to him, he was looking right in my face, man. He didn't say two words to me, he just looked at me, he was like... <laughs> He didn't need to talk. I know just what he was talking about. I looked right back at him. I was like... <laughs> Some white dudes on the front of the plane seen us. They were like, oh my God. I think those black guys are going to try to save us. Mm-mm. <laughs> We were just communicating that we understood the situation. We were both seeing the same thing. What we understood was simple. Terrorists don't take black hostages. <laughs> That's the truth. I have yet to see one of us on the news reading the hostage letters. Um, mm. They is treating us good. Uh, we all chilling and shit. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out to Ray Ray and Big Steve and uh, send some new points. You're not going to see it. And terrorists are smart. They know what they're doing there, you know. They're terrorists. They know it's black people's bad bargaining chips. <laughs> they called the White House. Hello? We have got five black... Hello? <laughs> You'd be back in D.C. You know what I was thinking, man? This is, this is an election year. I'm asking you, your white guy, do you know who you're voting for yet? Don't know, do you? Now, you see that? You see what just happened here? Let me tell you something. That is a cultural thing. He knows who he's going to vote for. He's just not going to tell me. <laughs> See? I've noticed that. That is a cultural thing. White people do not like to talk about their political affiliations. It's a secret. You ever ask a white guy who's voting for you? Hey, Bob, uh, Bob, who are you going to vote for? Dave, Dave, whoa, 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 Take it easy now. Take it easy. So anyway, um, I was fucking my wife in her ass, right? And, and I mean, it was something else. Yeah, 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 but, but, but who are you voting for? Dave! Dave, come on with the voting. I'm trying to tell you about fucking my wife here. Ask me all these personal questions. They don't like to divulge that information. Because it matters to them. Black people talk about that shit. Black people openly talk about politics. Black people openly talk about beating up politicians and shit. If I see George Bush, I'll kick his motherfucking ass for cutting my Medicaid. Oh, 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 oh. I would just say it. But there's a reason for that. It matters more for that. It matters more. Black people, see, see, even when I vote right, which I don't, but, but, <laughs> but even when I like, think about like, who I would vote for, right, I don't even look at their political policies. I just look at their character. You know what I'm saying now? You gotta read, no, I'm serious. You gotta read between the lines. Like, you know, you look at Clinton, and black people like Clinton, because we've seen him on the campaign. I saw one thing on the campaign trail. He, he actually just picked a black baby up and kissed him. Come here, you little nigger baby. Mwah! I just kiss him. I said, mm-hmm. I like that. He did not hesitate or nothing. You see George Bush Jr., he be that, ugh. <laughs> oh, but. Like, see, I'd never vote for George Bush Jr., but I don't know George Bush Jr.'s politics. The only thing I know about George Bush Jr. is that that guy sniffed cocaine. That's right. Now, listen, we cannot have that shit in the White House. That might be fine for a mayor, but God damn it, not in the White House. Not in the White House. 
The stakes are too high in the White House. Can't have no coke here president. Mm -mm. He'd be selling nuclear secrets for twenty, thirty dollars and shit. He'd be in meetings embarrassing America. Come on. Sign the treaty, baby. I suck your dick. Like what the Mr. President. 